The reviews are in for McDonald's hotter, juicier burgers. Let's hear what Hamburglar has to say. Bravo, bravo. What our old friend Hamburglar said is, The patties are juicier. The bun is a thing of beauty. The cheese perfectly melted. Bravo. My burger dreams have come true. You heard him, folks. These are McDonald's best burgers ever. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Bravo. Available at most restaurants in this area. Comparison of McDonald's classic burgers to prior burgers. Welcome to Orioles on the Verge. This is Zach Spedden, joined as always by Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens. And we are very excited tonight to welcome a special guest. He is the newly promoted Director of Player Development for the Baltimore Orioles. Joining us for the first time, Anthony Villa. Anthony, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, guys. So first off, congratulations on the move into your new role, which took place earlier this offseason. How are you preparing for your first season in this role? Just really making sure that I'm communicating with all of our different departments, you know, previously serving as the hitting coordinator. Your communication is focused mainly on your hitting coaches, your hitters, uh, maybe medical and strength and conditioning as some support staff. But now, you know, overseeing all of player development and, and having quite a few people help me at that, just making sure that we're touching base with everyone in the, uh, the broader scale department. So when Orioles fans are like, promote Enrique Bradfield to double A, is that is that directed at you now? <laughs> Partially. Um, <laughs> it's, it's still a group decision. There's going to be, you know, a team of us that are working to make quality decisions. So but if they want to yell at me, they can yell at me. <laughs> you could take it. Sure. Uh, and also for anyone who's not watching live and just listening on the po- podcast feed, uh, he is rocking on the Verge t-shirt. So, uh best guest that we have uh we've ever had on the show um so you were you were a hitter during your playing days you like you mentioned you just you spent the last few years working with hitters in the system but what's it like to now have to incorporate pitching development into the fold with your new role yeah a little outside of my comfort zone there um definitely just trying to listen and learn been fortunate to have good relationships with our pitching people over the years and you know part of the hitting side of things is study the enemy and so yeah I'm, I'm familiar with some of the metrics and styles but certainly no expert and wanting to just make sure i'm building good relationships with our pitching coaches pitching coordinators and and our pitchers you were originally hired to be the hitting coach for aberdeen after the 2019 season but 2020 season COVID obviously had an impact on that but you've still been with this organization since late 2019 how, how have you seen the organization evolve or where do you think you've seen the organization evolve the most since that time? Yeah, when COVID struck, we had a lot of people in sort of their first year in the organization starter roles. And it's been really cool to see people promoted throughout the organization and, and grow with the org. Um, both staff and players have ascended pretty quickly um, along with that. You know, when you're first starting out, you're really trying to get your philosophies dialed in. And then over time, you start to really grind on those philosophies and think, okay, how can we apply context to these to better service what's showing up in the game? And so I think we've seen a really nice blend of new people helping establish philosophies and then continuing to vet those philosophies and and grow in them. Yeah, even for us, it's been cool to to watch like the coaches – get promoted as well as the players like today it was announced Oscar Mercado is uh, the double-A manager and Felipe Alou going up to Aberdeen. It's just uh, that consistency is, is nice to see as well. And yeah, really uh, happy, really happy for Berto, really happy for Felipe. Uh, we've got Colin Woody, who's going to be a, uh, a new manager in Delmarva as well. I know the, uh, the staff getting released today is always pretty exciting and, yeah, it's been great to see really good people continue to rise in the organization. I always get Roberto and uh, Oscar, the former <laughs> Guardians Indians prospect uh, player, mixed up sometimes. So apologies there. Love that guy. Um, the prom- but also the promotion strategy since 2019 seems to be like to challenge the players at the level they're at. And then when they meet that challenge, advance them to the next and, and so on and so forth till they get to AAA where obviously the stakes are a little bit different. Does that remain consistent now that like the elite talent pipeline is established and packed full? Uh, and what are the pros and cons of that approach 
as opposed to, you know, what we've seen in the past before Elias and company took over where it was like a year to year level to level progression. Yeah. Hard to say if that's going to change or, you know, slow down. I think everyone might have good reason to believe it may not be as rapid with the major league team being as competitive as they are, the AAA team being as competitive as they are. There's only so many spots available, but um, over the years, the organization's been in a position to, to move players that have proved it pretty quickly. Uh, we think that that's worked out quite well. You know, players playing at levels, being young for their age and developing skills quite rapidly and cons, you know, you're not learning all of the lessons maybe that the level has to to show itself over the course of a long season. But we certainly feel like it's been great to push our players and we've been really proud of their progress. It seems like in Aberdeen specifically, like we watch so many of these top prospects, Gunner, Cowser, Mayo, Kerstad, Beavers. I just go on and on. But it seems like Aberdeen, the, the in-game results may not have been there for a while but eventually it clicks for so many of these guys. And it's like, it's like a NASCAR pit stop almost. It's like they come in, they get some adjustments, get some tweaks, and then they're out like a rocket. And they're up at AAA by the end of the year. Like what's, what's been the, speaking of promotions, what's been the, the secret there to making sure these guys are, are staying focused and not getting you know frustrated when maybe the, the, the process is right, but the results aren't always there for them? Yeah, I don't know if there's really any secret. Rather, you know, we try and make sure that our transitions from level to level are smooth. There's inevitably going to be some of those pit stops, as you referenced. Um, every level gets a little bit harder and, you know, provides its own challenges. And so, you know, Aberdeen does happen to be a pretty challenging level. We think that the jump from a low A to high A is very significant. Uh, the style of play starts to take on major league baseball a little bit more um just the way that like pitchers are evolving and just it becomes a pretty competitive level and so um again it's been really cool to see players move quickly and try their hand at all these different levels and we're just really proud of the work that they put in regardless of where they're at you know as we focus on promotions one thing that i think we always think about and a lot of our listeners ask about is what is the toughest jump outside of AAA in the major leagues? And it seems like in the last few years with the Orioles, you've had a little bit of an adjustment curve from low A to high A, but I'm sure it's more complex than that. So from what you see on both the hitters and the pitchers side, where does the biggest adjustment kick in? Yeah, that's a, a tough question because everyone's journey is so individual. Um, while some guys might move gracefully from low A to high A, others might not. Um, my personal opinion, I do think that low A to high A jump is pretty significant. Um, I think post COVID, the landscape now, we're seeing this jump from FCL to Delmarva to low A be pretty significant as well. You know, the slashing of short season A has made moving from the complex league up to the full season affiliate quite the challenge also. Uh, I know traditionally speaking, people say like once you get into double A, that's that's real professional baseball. And I think there's aspects of that too. double A, a tough level. Um, but if I had to give you an answer, my my personal opinion would be the jump from low A to high A. You mentioned the elimination of short season there. And that's uh, you're really the first guest we've had on to be able to ask this to Delmarva is like my favorite level to to pay attention to once things get rolling. I love watching these guys, such 18, 19 year old kids, when it starts to click for them and you see them take off and, you know, identifying those guys who maybe aren't putting up the, the big numbers, but you can see that potential kind of shine through most nights. But, you know, how has the organization gone about handling, preparing these 18, 19 year old kids really to make that jump from complex league to full season now that that short season step has been eliminated since the pandemic? Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, it's certainly a fun level because while the quality of baseball may not be as polished as AAA, uh, the learning that takes place is huge. And so, you know, big tip of the cap to our complex league staffs, both in the Dominican Summer League and the FCL. There's a ton of education that goes on both on the field and off the field. And then we're just constantly showing them clips 
and, and telling stories of what's taking place at those upper levels so that they feel as prepared as possible. You know, inevitably, it's still going to be tough when they get up there, but we really do pride ourselves from, from top to bottom being a really unified organization with the messaging that we give our players. And, and we feel like if we can educate them and, and we can show them what's up ahead, then they're going to be a little bit better to handle some of those those tough times coming. They need to like crank the air condition and sleep with no blankets to get used to the cold weather. And <laughs> It's funny. Some of our uh, Latin American players, they get up there for the first few days of practice before season starts. And they're like, oh, my gosh, it's freezing. Like, you know, it's, it's 45, 50 degrees. I've never spent a day below 60 degrees from playing in the so well. DR and then playing in Florida. This is their first experience at something sub 60 degrees. It's, it's crazy. I remember when you had uh, uh, Sam Jelinek on, the former voice of the Shorebirds, and I think one of my favorite stories, I guess, is told on this show was uh, when Daryl Hernandez was still in the organization, uh, and he was, what, 20 years old at the time, but he was like the old man down there at Delmarva, and you're telling guys, hey, make sure you wear long sleeves tonight. It's going to be cold, and they're like, until you get in that game action, you don't realize uh, how cold it is. Uh, but one more question about that, because you played – in short season ball when you were in the White Sox organization and then you made that jump to low A. Now you're on the other side of, of the game here. Do you, from your experience, is there anything that like, what what's missing in the development process with the elimination of short season ball? Is it something that's significant that the organization is still trying to you know tinker with and, and understand and, and wrestle with? Or do you think maybe it's been beneficial in some way even? I think it's been beneficial it sort of forces the growing up a little bit more. You know, I really, I don't know how much more there is to do, or if you could really say there's something missing because until you try your hand at going out and living on your own, playing the extended season, you know, 120 plus games, uh, the bus travel, sleeping in hotels, it's just, there's so many additional environmental aspects that are different than the complex league where you're still sleeping in your own bed every night. You're not playing series. You're playing uh, single games against teams. So yeah, just like all of those differences, I think it's really healthy to challenge our players with. How rare is it for an organization like the Orioles to be in the spot that they're in right now, which is you've now had back to back to back number one prospects in the game coming off a 100 plus win season and a farm system that shows no signs of slowing down when it comes to producing talent. Very, very rare. I mean, um, certainly hoping that we're showing no signs of, of slowing down, but um, it's been really cool to be a part of. It's been amazing to see the, the individual player stories as well as the way that these guys bond as a team and go about playing together throughout minor league baseball. And, and you just love seeing – this uh, this rise up through the minor leagues and help influence the major leagues. And we think what the major league team has done has, has obviously been incredible. I mean, the fact that we just traded for Corbin Burns, an ace, true ace in every sense of the word, and we lost two great players. Joey Ortiz, one of my favorite players in the organization, D.L. Hall, just incredible ceiling. And we're still the number one ranked farm system by a mile it's crazy but it's cool as orioles fans because we're spoiled and we can go root for these guys when they go to other teams and hope they achieve their uh their ceilings somewhere else except when they're playing against us of course <laughs> yeah certainly rooting for joey and dl hope they have a, a tremendous opportunity in milwaukee and and we'll miss them um at the same time very exciting to be able to get corbin burns and you know again it's it's a testament to the way that these players work the way that the coaches work and just really cool to see everyone continue to push to be the best versions of themselves. Coming off this 101 win season at the major league level, a lot of that was really driven by this young core that we've now seen rise to the to the top. It, we just talking about here is still boasts one of the top farm systems in baseball. And while things seem to be going very well for this organization, how much more pressure is now added with with all these increased expectations from from your point of view and in, in the player development side of things? There's no increased expectations if you look at fan graphs or baseball prospectus, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I'm sure there's pressure, of course, but that's why we play the game, right? You know, it's 
that's what you want. You want you want that pressure. Um, certainly a privilege to have that pressure on you. It means you're doing cool things that people care about. And and so, yeah, we're, we're excited to be in this type of situation. And it was a, a cool moment earlier this this off season when the International Dominican Republic uh, Academy was revealed. And, you know, that continues to just take flight and the international prospects continue to trickle up the system as that part of the game matures that Elias and Kobe Perez brought to the organization. Uh, do you see any breakouts this year in the mold of a Samuel Basayo, maybe not to like a top 10 or 15 prospect in all of baseball, but do you see any guys that are just going to pop this year when it comes to the international front? Um, to the level of Basayo, I mean, that was quite the, the leap. Pretty cool. Uh, we're very proud of him. He's worked tremendously hard. Um, I'll go with uh, a pitcher and a hitter, maybe as like names to, to look out for. Uh, Luis De Leon as the pitcher. You know, he spent some time in the complex last year, as well as up in Del Marva, and uh, definitely flashed some exciting stuff. And then offensively, Brylan Tavera uh, had a nice year. In the Florida complex, I know that he's gotten some some publicity, um, but I actually I saw him down in the DR recently. I was able to be there for the inauguration of the new academy, and it's it's incredible. Uh, the organization did an amazing job with that, and uh, yeah, Tavera is looking pretty good. We're very excited for him. He's actually been one of the few prospects in the system that I've struggled to kind of wrap my head around, just because at, he gets at the time a record signing bonus for an Orioles international signing. So obviously the organization loves him. A lot of public reports, like you mentioned, he's gotten some high praise publicly, these you know, public baseball America outlets like that, you know, top 15, 20 prospect in the system. Some outlets are kind of skeptical on him. We obviously haven't been able to get our eyes on him up close and personal. Uh, hopefully he's in Delmarva this year and we finally get to see him live for the first time. But when we get to watch him in Delmarva this year for the first time, what kind of player can we expect to see with him? Yeah, him along with so many of these international players, they're so young. So the rate of change can be so great. Um, observing Brylin in the Dominican Summer League in 2022 and then the FCL last season in 23, you know, he has the potential to be a five-tool player. The frame's very exciting. Uh, he controls the strike zone really well. The contact skill increased this past season in the FCL. There's big power potential there. Um, so we, we certainly like the upside. Now, that's not to say that there won't be some struggles in Delmarva. Uh, definitely a learning curve. But at his age and how young he'll be for the level, you know, if, if he's getting regular opportunity, we would be very excited to see how he continues to, to mature. And it, if that speaking of that, it's something we've observed the last couple of years is a young guy coming into Delmarva your hopes are, are high, like Daryl Hernandez in 2021, um, Creed Williams in 2022. They don't perform all that well, but you can see flashes, and then they come back to the level the next year and just excel. And that's kind of what we're expecting Anderson Daler Santos to do. So just saying, uh, if Brylin Tavera comes out and doesn't light up the field this year, that doesn't mean that he won't do it the next year. Yeah, certainly. Um, you mentioned Daryl and Creed, both two great stories. And again, uh, some common themes you're going to keep hearing, like the learning that's taking place. And so if you're playing at a level and you're young, you know, there's a lot of learning taking place. And if it doesn't go great, you're like, you have your chance to, to get them next year. You mentioned Anderson De Los Santos, you know, played really well at the complexes this past year, had some ups and downs in Del Marva, but he's still young and very talented, shows good tools. And we're really excited for his season coming up this year as well. Going back to the Academy in the Dominican Republic, which opened this offseason, there's been a lot of focus on how that's going to help the Orioles bring in players off the international free agent market. And that's been something that Kobe Perez and his team have made significant strides on in the last few years. But from a player development perspective, how is it going to benefit players who are already in the organization? It's, it's going to be a game changer. Uh, we just had... Uh, some players down there, again, part of seeing the uh, the new academy, the inauguration, was also getting to stay down there for a little extra time and, and work with some players. And you're talking about having more space, you know, four cage tunnels instead of two. So that's just more reps, more work, 
more opportunity, three fields instead of two, um, a lot more bullpens, classroom space, the cafeteria is bigger, the dorms are nicer, just, just all of it creates a better experience and a better environment for player development to, to take hold. We want to um, kind of turn back now to the work you've done with hitters in this organization. And one thing we've been wondering, we want to get your thoughts on this. What is easier to work with as far as development is concerned? Is it a player who hits the ball hard and in the air, but has too much swing and miss? Or is it someone that has a plus hit tool that needs to tap into their raw power a little bit more and hit the ball in the air consistently? Um, I mean, it's sort of a, a trade-offs game, right? So if they have like this high slugging damage potential and some swing and miss, so if they out slug their whiff, like they're still going to be productive. Um, assuming like the trade-offs are kind of equal, like the strengths and weaknesses of each are of the same magnitude. I, I would say it is like really hard to positively influence contact rates. So, um, Give me the, the guy with bat to ball skills that can grow into their power, especially if they're young. Um, not to say that you can't be a high swing and miss player and still be productive, but I think that contact skill uh, can tap into some power as they continue to mature. So how much power are we going to see from Enrique Bradfield Jr. this year? Those elite contact rates. <laughs> elite contact rates, uh, again, uh, we really try hard to, be able to communicate the profile of a player to them and, and use examples of players in the major leagues and put our heads together and have thorough conversation about how can you be the best version of yourself? How can you be the most productive? And so with Enrique, it's for sure high contact rates, getting on base, shoot, every walk of his is like a double or a triple because of the ability to steal bases. And so if the on-base percentage can be really attractive for him, he's, he's going to be a incredible player seemed like every time it walk then uh, a balk and then a stolen base uh it was it was fun to follow those fcl box scores um and speaking of that 2023 draft uh, it seems like from the position side of things like a lot of plus athletes ability to steal bases i mean even guys like jake cunningham the, the tool shed himself big power hitter but he can steal bases play good defense did the new rules at the major league level, like the the shift rules, pickoff limits, and and other rules that have been in place at the major league level, has that impacted how the organization goes about drafting players and developing players, or has that just kind of been like an added bonus? As far as drafting players go, uh, I'm not so sure. Like, not not my area to weigh in on. Uh, I don't I don't get to influence the draft process much. But uh, as far as player development goes. Certainly, I mean, we're looking at the level that we hope they're gonna go play one day. And so we need them to be developing those tools and those skills. And so stealing bases, uh, taking the extra base, all, all those little things that we can do to earn an advantage on the bases, um, ranging up defensively with limitations in the shift, just getting really good athletic players and starting to build some versatility with them. It, it's all very valuable. All right, on a different note, you know, ever since, I don't know, 2020, 2021, when the Orioles farm system really started taking off, I feel like a lot has been made of, yeah, there's all these great hitting prospects, but the pitching prospects or the pitching cupboard is bare was a famous line. Uh, we personally, we see the depth. We think 2024 is going to be the year where the pitching development in the minors really makes itself evident on a broader, wide scale. What kind of traits does a team look for and how do you build off of that? It seems like, you know, they like you guys like a, a hoppy fastball, a fastball with a little bit of zip to it and then just work from there. What, what do you think? Yeah, happy to hear the pitching department get some love from you guys. I know certainly over the past few years, it's been a lot of hitting prospects and that's just sort of the way that the draft is lined up for us and the accumulation of talent. But We've been super proud of the pitching department for the past few seasons and think they've done a tremendous job of building value. Um, as far as characteristics go, first and foremost, you know, high character pitchers, high character people, uh, the way that they work, the focus, the work ethic, it's really impressive. Um, and then, right, with, with this new technology era, you're, you're looking for 
metrics that seem to scale to higher levels. And so I don't think it's any secret in saying like velocity and movement are attractive and, you know, guys that can find the strike zone with a multitude of pitches, like all of that's pretty attractive. And, you know, again, tip of the cap to our pitching department. We think can we throw how they go about building, building talent. Look at that 2023 draft class, and it, it was loaded with pitchers and some guys that have some of the traits you just talked about. Is there a pitcher or two in that class you think is primed for a big breakout this year? There's a lot of them. Uh, we were very excited about the the depth, the pitching talent that we acquired in that draft class. Um, I'll, I'll try and stay away from like the obvious names, you know, the higher picks like the bomb Easters, but uh, I think Teddy Sharkey is a guy that could be pretty exciting. Um, and being around him a little bit, that dude loves to pitch, just loves to get hitters out, very intense and uh, very fun to watch him do his thing. I think uh, a, a guest on our show called him a psychopath, and that was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we're talking about the going back to the coaches real quick at, with the announcement of the coaches. And sorry, I also have. It looks like the Orioles also just acquired Nick Maton live as we uh, as we're recording this uh, episode. All right, uh, cool. We'll dive into that later. But um, another hitter to the organization, as we have a former uh, hitting instructor on. Um, but with the release of, of the new coaching staff, it looks like there is a new name I wanted to ask you about, just because I've always said I, I think we need a whole podcast series on just the coaches and instructors in this organization because there seem to be some high quality people on here as well, but new triple uh, a hitting coach, Mike Modville uh, joining Norfolk as a hitting coach after former, he was with triple a uh, system in Boston, former university of Maryland product here. What can you tell us about him? The new guy in the organization. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say first and foremost, the podcast with a bunch of different coaches would be pretty entertaining. Uh, <laughs> the stories that they have and working with these players, the relationships that they build, um, certainly fun to listen to. Uh, we are very excited about Mike Montville. He was coaching out at the Arizona Fall League the same season that Kerstad and Reed Trimble and Prieto um, offensively were representing us out there. And they got along really well with Mike. You know, he's a guy that we've had eyes on and uh, he's got some experience being in AAA with the Woo Sox. And uh, he spent this offseason coaching for Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico, for Caguas. They actually, they won the Winter League in Puerto Rico. And unfortunately, they actually lost in the Caribbean Series today. So he's driving um, up to Sarasota to get ready for spring training tomorrow. But sounds like he had an amazing Winter League experience. His team played really well. And, you know, we really believe in Mike and are trusting him with some great hitters in Norfolk. And we're really excited for him to join the organization. Speaking of uh, Norfolk or the upper levels of the system, the non-roster invitee list came out this week, and I know that Jackson Holiday is a name that a lot of Orioles fans are focused on, whether or not he's going to make the roster. But when you look at the group of prospects that were included uh, as non-roster invitees, who really jumps out at you? I mean, there's quite a few. Uh, certainly, Jack's headlines it. Uh, Kobe Mayo had an incredible season last year. You know, there's there's a lot of really good players. Um, so very excited that camp is continuing to be competitive. Uh, very excited for players not on the 40 man roster to be getting that learning experience and just excited for that group to continue to stay together and push each other. We always like to ask this question whenever we have a member of the player development staff on our show. And that is, is there a prospect or maybe a couple of prospects that you don't think get a lot of credit maybe from outside the organization that you think should get more attention? This is the Matt Blood call your shot. Matt <laughs> Joey Blood. Ortiz breaking out this year, <laughs> two, three years ago. Nice. Um, <laughs> gosh, there's a lot of ways that this one could go. Uh, we've got a lot of really good players and a lot of players that deserve um, some limelight. So, you know, we're certainly like super proud of the way that these guys work and push themselves. But if I had to 
let's do this. Let's say a player that spent time at the complex and then we'll go with like a new draft guy as well, since maybe they haven't had as much coverage as guys that have been in the system longer. So complex league. Um, I said Luis De Leon as a pitcher and, and we'll go with Tomas Sosa as a hitter. Uh, left-handed bat. He believes he's the reincarnation of Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> he's an amazing kid. Uh, we're very excited about him. So I'll say Tomas Sosa. And then draft class-wise, you know, I mentioned Teddy Sharkey um, not being one of those, you know, top couple round picks, but we're very high on him. And um, say Matt Etzel played really well in his first little go in professional baseball. And again, another guy that wasn't First couple of round picks, but amazing athlete showed really well. Uh, we're very excited about about Etzel as well. So, hope there's some names to to look out for, and hopefully, I'm right when we check back in a year. Well, Etzel's a guy that really jumped on our radar last year with the way that he performed at Del Marva. It seems like he has a little bit of everything skill set wise. Is there something you think he's really gonna one tool you think he could really take a big step forward with? this season? I think the consistency is what really was so attractive. Um, the bat to ball and power combination, the speed, you know, played some center field, just like a pretty nice package. And I think the bat to ball skills could really show up as he continues to climb levels. I'm that just six tool being his beard, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. He's got a pretty good look to him. I think he said, in the past, he dressed up as the caddy from Happy Gilmore for Halloween. <laughs> you always got to love a good Halloween costume. That's nice. <laughs> That's awesome. I just love the Thomas uh, Tomas Sosa, Sosa shout out, uh, especially the fact that he thinks he's the next King Griffey Jr., my favorite player growing up. It seems like a lot of these, especially the younger international players, they're coming into this organization with some swag. I feel like Freddie Ben Cosme also believes he is better than anyone else. And I say that in, in a very positive way way the legendary hashtag uh we know basaya we've seen glimpses of his personality i think there was a video a couple years ago when he was in the complex league when he got hit by a pitch a very soft pitch and just like falls and really exaggerates the whole thing it's, it seems like a lot of these guys have a lot of fun personality i, I know i'm excited to finally see more of these guys in delmarva and work their way up to aberdeen hopefully this year yeah a lot of fun personality mm -hmm. um the young latin american players are super fun to work with it's really fun to see them continue to mature. You know, we want to pump them up. We want to promote them and and get them to be the best versions of themselves and show their personality and their flair. And yeah, they're a ton of fun to have around. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your insight and best of luck to you and the rest of the Orioles organization this season. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks again, guys. And thanks for all you do. It's always fun to come off the field after uh, being at the affiliate games and check the verge on Twitter and see the clips of who was punching tickets or hitting homers. So we appreciate you guys being such loyal fans. It's great. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank and you. We look forward to delivering more of that in 2024. We will be back with our next episode later this week, taking a look at the Orioles non roster invitees to spring training. In the meantime, you can check us out on social media at Facebook X Instagram, Threads, TikTok. We are also over at Substack, Orioles on the For Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to Orioles on the Birds.